This week on Merchants of Change, it's a big one. We've got Mark Thurman, currently the COO of Tenable. Tenable is a $4 billion publicly traded company. Mark played college football for Hofstra University, had a legendary sales and sales leadership career. He's built and run teams at PTC, EMC, and Turbonomic, among others. He's had several successful exits. He's hired, led, and mentored thousands of salespeople and has worked alongside former guests Jim McInerney, John Kaplan, and me, J.R. Butler. So here he is, Mark Thurman. I'm J.R. Butler, co-founder of The Shift Group, and you're listening to Merchants of Change. This is a podcast about transferring the skills and behaviors we acquire as athletes into being a professional technology salesperson. Each week, we'll introduce you to a top performer who will help us understand how they became professional merchants of change. What's up, kid? How we doing, Mark? JR, JR, how are you, my good friend? It's great to see good. you, pal. Great to see you, man. I'm so excited for this episode. We're gonna, we're, our audience is gonna get so much out of this, man. We're, we're, we're gonna we're have going some fun. Here, I love it. I love it. We'll have some fun, my man. We'll have some fun. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, so, so Mark, I, I know you know a lot about our business and 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 our audience. Um, our audience is all kind of new sellers and people considering a, a shift into the sales profession. Um, and obviously we focus really, really myopically on, on athletes that are transitioning into this career. So I want to talk a lot about, um, you know, sales today. Yep. Uh, but we always start at this, at the same point, which is with the athletic career. So, um, I know from your background, you played hockey and football growing up. Yep. Um, and, and linebacker at Hofstra. Um, I'd love to know, and you played with some great players. Can you tell yeah. me a little bit about your, your favorite memory from playing football at Hofstra? Yeah, it was awesome, right? So uh, super, super lucky to end up there. So yeah, went to, grew up in the Boston area, went to Westwood High School, and then played some, a little bit of hockey and then football and loved it. And then did one year at Worcester Academy, uh, right behind Holy Cross, up on the hill in uh, beautiful Worcester. And, you know, spent one year at Worcester Academy, but... It was really transformative and ended up getting recruited with two other guys from Worcester Academy that I became very friendly with. And we went down and did a recruiting trip to Hofstra. We fell in love with the place. And yeah, I spent four years there and um, just an incredible, incredible experience. And you look back on it and let me just set the record straight on a couple things. A, I was absolutely a horrible football player, right? So I don't want any... <laughs> You know, this elite athlete and all that, that was not me. I was not elite by any stretch of the imagination, right? But I loved, I loved football. And uh, when I got down there, you really see what some incredible athletes from all around the country are, are coming in there. And, you know, we, we had a few guys that made it to the NFL, Wayne Corbett and Dave Fiore and a few other guys that we played with. And then they had a huge number after. But what I loved more than anything was the camaraderie of being with a team and being able to do film study and then be able to lift weights and then be able to travel on the road and be able to, you know, spend time. And those relationships that were formed at Hofstra were still, to this day, some of the tightest relationships I have. I've got a crew that comes out of my Cape house in the summertime for a few days. We go down to New York City for Christmas holidays, things like that. And, um, and that was awesome. And it was, uh, yeah, one of the, the funnest times of my life when it was playing football down at Hofstra. Um, but I, I do have one highlight, and I don't even know, it probably is not considered a highlight, but I, when I'm saying I was not very good, I was not very good. I had one sack in four years of college football. <laughs> one, literally. But the one sack was pretty cool. As I said, I went to Worcester Academy, um, and I went to Worcester Academy with a couple buddies from actually high school, from Westwood High School. And a couple buddies then ended up going to college, football. One went to Union. The other one went to URI. And I went to Hofstra. My senior year, we ended up playing URI. He's the starting center for URI. I'm playing linebacker. And I have an inside blitz. And I'm arguably like the slowest, strong side linebacker you've ever seen. 
but I have an inside blitz between the center and guard, and I go past my buddy, sack a quarterback, ugly tackle, but made a tackle, and then slap him in the butt. And I said to him, I'm like, you will never live this down. Literally, <laughs> slap him in the butt. You'll never. And to this day, every time we get together, every time we see each other, I bring the story up. He's actually come to me and said, hey, Thurman, I met some people that knew you, and they talk about this story that you went by me. So I, I get a lot of mileage out of that one, but it was awesome. But that, yeah, that's probably the only highlight I actually have. Well, li- listen, don't, first of all, don't sell your share, yourself short on the elite thing, right? I, I, I have to remind our athletes, there's 19 million college students in the United States and only 460,000 play a sport. Yeah. So that's 2.4%. That's elite, right? So I, trust me, as a, as a fellow slow footed, American like yourself, I, yeah. I can appreciate what you're saying, but it's still, Absolutely. and by the way, getting up to Vernon Hill is no joke. I will make, I was three and one against Worcester Academy at Cushing. Oh by yeah. The way, just That's so you right. know. That's right. You were That's right. <laughs> yeah. But it was great. You know, it, it was awesome. And uh, I, I mean, I, I encourage, you know, anyone that's playing high school sports, you know, no matter what division was division three, division two, one, a, or one, a one, double a, one, a, the lessons that you learn by being part of the team and being exposed to that type of environment, you've got kind of a full-time job, even though you're going to school and you're grinding, you're building relationships, you're literally doing time management, you're doing things that when you do graduate, without a doubt, and I've seen it in numerous companies, you set yourself apart. And, um, and it's just a lot of fun, you know, in the yeah. friendships, the friendships are, are life, lifelong friendships. Yeah, my face lit up when you said bus rides because like a million memories streamed oh, yeah. my, into my head. Um, do you have Do you have any favorite teammates at, at Austria? You know what? I, I we have a crew that we still hang out with today, and it honestly, and it's a big crew. I mean, there's probably fifteen to twenty deep. We get together constantly throughout the year. Um, as I said, there's you know with Christmas coming up, a bunch of us will get together down in Manhattan. Um, around Christmas, and we we you know head out to the Hamptons in the summertime for some friends. They come up to my place in Long Island. So there's a really good crew, and it spans not just my class. It spans a bunch of classes above me. It spans a bunch of classes below me. Um, and so we just have a, a good group. But I'll give you an example. When we get together down in New York City, there'll be you know 100 to 125 folks from Austria, from all different age groups that will get together wow. and um, you know kind of connect and. Uh, it's pretty special. It's just a really, really good group of folks. And I even go back to Worcester Academy. You know, some of the friendships I made in that one year of prep school are friendships I have today. You know, never mind the couple of guys I went to Hofstra with from Worcester. Um, but there are other people there that ended up playing football and other colleges that we still remain very close. And uh, yeah. that school holds a, a place near and dear to my heart, too. Those, those boarding school ties run deep, no doubt. Big I time. appreciate that. No um, question. No question. I, I'd, I'd be curious to know, like, if we got if we got those teammates together and you weren't in the room, how would how would they describe Mark Thurman at Austria? Yeah, uh, a few things. First, going back to slow, they would say maybe the <laughs> slowest person ever to play college football. So that would probably be number one. Um, but no, I, I think what they'd say is, I, listen, I when I played and even in business, I I, I bring a lot of energy and I bring a lot of intensity. And I bring a lot of hard work, right? Um, you know, one of the greatest lines that I learned through my parents, right? Hard work is the great equalizer. And because I wasn't a great athlete, I had to make up for it just to be able to play in, 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 in college. You know, I had to be able to be pretty intense, pretty focused, and had to kind of grind. I had to work harder, you know, than the other folks that were just more talented, better athletes. And so I think they'd say, uh, I like to have a little bit of fun. So let's say Thurman definitely had some fun there. But he was a pretty intense, focused kind of grinder. Is probably the way they did they, summarize it. Yeah, and I and I can speak from experience. That intensity and energy is definitely infectious, and I'm sure that it, it was infectious in the locker room too. Um, so so you you you're grinding it out playing football at Hofstra. When did you start thinking about like a career in sales? Were there were there other were there other paths you you considered? You know what? It, there wasn't really other paths. I didn't know what category or what vertical I wanted to go into, but I knew I wanted to be in either sales or marketing. And, you know, again, I will kind of look to some of the folks that were graduating, you know, three or four years above me at Hofstra and looking at some of the careers and, you know, at that time, really, you know, how much money they were making and those type of things and the industries they're going into. 
And I, I knew in that senior year, when I, mean, I was doing interviews, you know, halfway through my senior year, um, lining up jobs. So I had a job kind of already done and dusted even before I graduated, getting into sales. And so I knew I wanted to be in sales. Um, wasn't really sure. And I kind of had a few different opportunities. Um, and I, at that time, I took the opportunity being a little bit uneducated on the market on a job that I thought I could make the most money at. And that was kind of one of the big priorities for me at that time. Um, but I pretty much knew and I had always had jobs. I've always, you know, wanted to make make money and have a career, and was pretty focused on that, you know, from a pretty young age. Um, but I was locked and loaded there that senior year. I was definitely thinking about, you know, companies and verticals and industries that I wanted to get into from a sales and marketing perspective. So I, I believe after your first year, you you went over into hematology supplies for like labs and hospitals for Abbott. Yeah. What, what do you? What do you yeah. remember about that job? It was great. So when I first graduated, I went to a company called Airborne Express. And Airborne Express, back in the day, a lot of the younger folks won't, won't even know this company, but it was uh, the third player in overnight transportation. So we competed with Federal Express and UPS. And Airborne Express, the value prop with Airborne Express was a business-to-business -business relationship. So we could actually ship. If you were a business shipping to other businesses, we could do it cheaper and quicker than FedEx and UPS because we weren't delivering to residential areas, weren't to living in communities. And so you talk about prospecting. You, I would go to Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens. That was my territory and go to the high rises. So this wasn't phone calls. This wasn't emails. This was door to door, banging at the top, would start off and work 100, 150 floors all the way down. So we'd be in this building all day and you'd knock on hundreds of doors and hey, do you use currently UPS or Federal Express on the Airborne Express and did the pitch literally hundreds of times a day. And that to me was, I think, one of the most beautiful ways to start my sales career because it taught me the importance of prospecting and being in front of customers and really kind of controlling your own destiny. Because at the end of the day, the more prospecting you did, the more money you made because the more pipeline you built up. So I did that for a little bit over a year and then actually approached by a recruiter. And when I graduated Hofstra, I thought, it, I, thought I wanted to get into pharmaceutical or medical sales. And lucky enough, I got approached by a recruiter for a company called Abbott Laboratories. And so Abbott is a huge, massive conglomerate now. Um, I was recruited by their diagnostics division. So selling big, expensive laboratory equipment. So hematology, clinical chemistry, and immunoassay laboratory equipment to reference labs and physician office labs throughout Brooklyn, Queens, and Manhattan. And that was really amazing training. We went to Northern Chicago for three and a half months. They taught you about the technology. They taught you about the sales process. They tell you how to work and engage with doctors and, you know, executives at hospitals and building out physician office labs. So that was truly the first real taste I got of just world-class enablement and training. And it was, uh, again, it was an awesome, awesome run. Unreal. Yeah. Um, I heard you won Rookie of the Year. Is that a true story? I did. That's a true story. And it's actually how I got into software sales. Um, so this is kind of a funny story. Um, so I ended up being rookie of the year and I, I got lucky. I'll be again, transparent. I got lucky that at that time in Brooklyn, a lot of doctors in Brooklyn were building out physician office labs because they could charge for an assay, Medicaid and Medicare, thousands of dollars. So they saw it as a business opportunity to be building out these big physician office labs. So I was able to do a bunch of business in, in Brooklyn, Queens. And I ended up calling up my mother. And my mother is an extremely hardworking, very, very successful uh, woman. She did an incredible job raising, you know, myself and my four brothers and sisters and very prideful, right? Irish background. And I was talking to her and I was bragging. I said, hey, listen, I just won Rookie of the Year. And I think at that time it was like 70. I said, I just made over $70,000. I'm killing it. I'm They're flying me back to Chicago and I'm going to present it to the new hire class. And my mother, being my mother, said, oh, that's great. She said, I was just talking with Mrs. Halligan and her son, Brian, made, and at that time, probably like 200 grand or something crazy at Parametric Technology. And I had gone to high school with Brian Halligan. Our parents, my mother and his mother, were actually very close. His, his mother, Eileen Halligan, who was an amazing woman, um, they were very close. So they would kind of brag about their kids. But... When I heard Brian Halligan, so we went to high school, he was a couple grades above me, I, I heard Brian did so well, I called him up the next day and said, hey, it's Mark Thurman, not sure you remember me from high school, 
but I just won Rookie of the Year, and I heard you're killing it. And Brian said, yeah, you know, I'm at this company, PTC. We're growing gangbusters. You know, we look for aggressive, you know, sellers that can be educated, that can get trained, um, but have really good, hardworking kind of DNA. And I said, can I come up for an interview? He said, yep. So I went up three days later, interviewed with Brian Halligan, John McMahon, and John Hanlon, and got the job that day. John McMahon was the one that actually gave me the job. Um, and it's the funny part about the story is for people that don't know who Brian Halligan is, so not only did Brian Halligan kill it at PTC and ended up absolutely having an incredible run at PTC, he then left and created a company uh, with Ray Ozzy, uh, who's a very, very famous technologist, sold it to Microsoft Groove. And then he actually was founder, went to MIT, got his MBA, but then he was founder of HubSpot, which today is arguably one of the most, you know, highest market cap of any publicly traded software company on the planet, 40 to $50 billion market cap, which Brian was founder and, and CEO is now chairman of HubSpot, but one of the most successful uh, entrepreneurs ever to come out of the city of Boston. So pretty amazing story, but that's how I actually got into software, with my mom bragging to another mom and then getting an interview out of it. That's wild. I, I was going to ask if it was the same Brian Halligan. It that's is the same, same Brian Halligan. Yep, absolutely. Wow. Funny world. Small world and, and funny story. Oh, that's, that's incredible. Well, you know, Mark, you and I have gotten a chance to work together. I, I learned so much from you, even in the short time we spent together. But most people that are going to listen to this aren't going to get that opportunity. So I want to I wanna hit them with the, with the Thurman knowledge and sure. just hit them with as many sales la lessons as possible. Yeah. Um, can you walk, walk us through uh, your three H's and, and why they're so important for, yeah. for salespeople? Yeah, you bet. So the three H's, I try to simplify it. And whether I'm looking, you know, for new hires, so looking for folks coming, you know, right into either BDRs or SDRs or inside sales, or even when I look at promoting certain leaders and looking at different folks within the organization, and I kind of try to keep it really simple. And it's the three H's and it's head, heart, and hard work, right? And the way I, I, I talk about it is the head is the intelligence level, right? Are they smart enough to comprehend the technology? Can they articulate the technology? You know, did they get good grades? Do they have a nice high GPA coming out of college? You know, do they have the intellect to be able to sell and position this type of technology, you know, that we have at whatever company I was at? So the intellect is really important, right? The other one is the heart. And this is what I talked about before, which is the passion, the enthusiasm, right? It's contagious. Right, especially when you're selling and you're marketing a technology and a product, you want to have passion. You want to have energy. You want the people that you're talking to to understand that you believe in it, right? With all of your heart, that this is the right solution for them. That this is solving, you know, business problems and solving and taking care of business challenges. And no one wants to buy from someone that has low energy or no passion or no enthusiasm. You know, you just don't want to be there. So that is the second thing I look for. The third, without a doubt, is the most important, right? And I, I literally, I, 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 I say this so much, it's, it's insane. And I probably say it 50 times a week to my employees, my kids, my friends, people that are calling up for advice. It's the hard work. It's the work ethic. And as I said, right, it's a great line, great line you know, from my parents, right? Hard work is the great equalizer. And so when I talk to and I interview people, I have a very specific question I ask. And it isn't like, what was the most challenging time of your life? Or what was the hardest thing you had to come across? And you know, I say, give me an example of when you outwork someone else to achieve a goal. And I'll always get this look like, whoa, 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 what? Like, what? I say, give me an example, whether it's in sports, it's in academics, it's in social. Give me an example in your life where you worked harder than someone else to achieve a goal. And sometimes they've got to sit back, they've got to think about it. But then when the wheels start turning, you can truly start understanding folks in the ethic, the work ethic, and how they overcame some things. I've had some incredible, incredible stories, folks. I remember, and this has been maybe two or three times, I've had candidates say, hey, you know what? I'm dyslexic. So for me to do better in a test, because I was dyslexic, I had to study four hours compared to peers in college. I had to study one hour to understand a certain you know, math issue or a math problem or an English issue. And so those things, like, those are the people I want in my corner. Those are the people when they walk through, whether they're playing sports and saying, hey, I came into the situation, I was the man or I was the woman in high school. I came in there, I was undersized, I was slow, 
I lived in the weight room. I lived in the film study. I was able to outgrind. And by my senior year, I was starting. You know, I was able to become captain when there were so many more people that had so much more talent. Those are the type of folks that you want to just surround yourself with, right? So it's the head, it's the heart, and it's the hard work are the three big things that I really try to I dig into when I'm talking to people, when I'm hiring people, when I'm promoting people, always in the back of my head, the three H's. I love that. I'm stealing it. I'll give you credit twice, then it's mine. Um, <laughs> there you go. No problem. <laughs> so we've, had, we've, we've been fortunate. We had Cap on here. Um, and I've gotten to know the, the your old PTC crew through Chris Reisig. Yeah. You've gotten to meet a lot of the guys. And, and I've heard, uh, first I want to ask you about the 2X principle from PTC. Yeah. Can you talk yeah. about that a little bit? You bet. So this is when I first started, right? So as I said, you know, John McMahon hired me. Uh, Brian Halligan interview with and John Hamlet and Johnny is to this day one of my closest friends, but also a mentor and, and just a great boss. And when you're in there at PTC, and again, this was back in the day where you're like prospecting through phone books and door to door and, you know, and it was very specific, right? You were selling to companies that built discrete manufacturing products, right? So you, it was really one vertical. You're selling to manufacturing companies. And, you know, when I sat down with John and there were a few other sellers in there, uh, John just gave phenomenal, gave me a ton of advice for my career. But one of the things was the two X principle. And he said, literally, he goes, come in here and look at what the highest performers are doing and do two X. So if they're making a hundred calls a day, you do 200. If they're going out and cold calling and knocking on doors for two hours, you do it for four hours, everything. And it wasn't what the average, right? Inside sales or sales rep is doing. It's what is the elite, the highest end, and then you two X it. Now, it was a grind and it was hard, but that simple principle of 2X, and this can apply, like especially obviously with your athletic background, hockey, for instance. Like think about going into the backyard and shooting hockey pucks. I'm sure your dad said, hey, JR, go shoot 100. But in the back of your mind, if you did 200, if you did 2X, what your dad said, who's a legendary coach in Massachusetts, that's going to make you that more effective. So that 2X principle can be applied so simply across all disciplines. But it was something as basic as it sounds that they kind of ingrained into your mentality as a young seller at PTC, you know, it was one of the reasons just in regards to the way we prospect and, and went for new business and tried to find new opportunities. You know, that was super simple, but it was unbelievably effective. And it was, it was drilled into you very aggressively, you know, back there in the mid nineties. The, the, the downline of, like future leaders that came out of PTC is like mind boggling to me. What, what, like obviously the two X thing is awesome. Yeah. Um, but what, why else? How come so many top performers came out of PTC? You think? Yep. So I think back then it was absolutely, I think the key was the hiring profile. So very similar, honestly, Jared, to what you're doing at the shift group, right? It's bringing in the right people that are going to enjoy being challenged, that are going to enjoy being in a competitive environment, that are going to enjoy, and probably the biggest thing is being accountable, right? At, at PTC, there was no place to hide, right? If, if you didn't execute, I mean, we used to have these legendary drill downs every Friday. You'd have to roll up how many meetings you had, how many demos that you did, how much you added to the pipeline, you know, how many executive buyers and economic buyers did you get to that week? Like every Friday. And so, man, and this wasn't with Zoom. So that we had to all dial in on like a polycom and you're on with seven other reps and you're already, and you're on Friday before you started your weekend, you were to roll up your activity. And if you were on the bottom, even if you felt you had a good week, you got kind of roasted and you were held accountable. And it just kind of drove this mission every week. No one ever wanted to be on the bottom. No one ever wanted to be the one catching some heat on that conference call on a Friday afternoon. And so you did extraordinary things to be on top and that culture just spread and then you know i give you know john mcmahon and dick harrison and there's another gentleman mike mcginnis like there were some incredible people there that then started putting in things like medic and now what you hear about with you know force management how you message and position you know the same way across the planet so putting in kind of command of the message and, you know, command of the plan type language. So everywhere around the globe, you drove your business consistently and it was accurate and it was data driven even back then. 
very, very specific on clean, accurate data, and then holding everyone accountable. And that really, that culture was phenomenal. And that's why I think you created, you, you, A, you brought in the right type of DNA, so you recruited the right profile, but then you did training and enablement, and then you held them accountable. And those principles still hold true today, right? More technology, more automation, all those things, but those principles will stay with you for life. And that's why I think you see so many successful people taking these principles that were born and raised in them and then bringing them to either startups or well-established publicly traded companies, you know, and you see these folks being kind of uber successful. Yeah. And, and, and the, what I see and the people that I've worked with that came out of there like you is like this, this accountability to specifically like elite qualification. Like I think that that's really what drove it. It's one of the reasons we, every, every candidate we work with that takes a role in our hiring network, we give them a one year subscription to force management's ascender platform and they have to get medic certified in their first 60 days as a BDR, because I know awesome. that if they start their career with that foundation, it's, it's a game changer. Like it changes the whole trajectory of your career forever. It literally, it gives you this super simple playbook. Even if you have very little experience to understand where you are in a sales campaign. And to get back to what you said, we were voracious qualifiers at PTC. You know, they would be more mad if you wasted two months on a sales cycle that was poorly qualified than if you lost head to head versus one of our competitors at the time. Because time was money back then and it still is today. But being a voracious qualifier, especially in these tough economic climates like we're in today, is even super important, obviously, also. But those are the things that kind of got ingrained, you know, into your into your head back in the day at, at PTC. I love it. Um, yeah. So, so we... We got listeners out there, right? We like to yeah. think that most of, most of our kids they bring the three H's to the table. Um, we were we don't work in exclusive agreements, so typically when we bring a kid in, he's usually getting he or she's usually getting two or three offers. How how, how would you coach a young person who's just starting out their career? How, how are they gonna like? What's the best way to evaluate potential places to start yeah. their career? Specifically? You bet. You bet. So there's a, there's a few things. There's one kind of methodology that I'll kind of walk you through really quick. Um, but one thing I'll say before I hit the methodology is really try to figure out that junior and senior year, what type of areas are you passionate about? Like, are there certain either verticals? Like, are you passionate about manufacturing? Are you passionate about healthcare? Do you have some type of connection to financial services? Do you have some connection in regard to infrastructure, technology? I really think dialing that in and trying to have a sense and obviously doing internships your senior year critical. The other thing I will really try to emphasize is using the network, using people that have graduated, that have gone through your program, that have played athletics and talking to folks that have graduated three to four years ahead of you to kind of understand what is the true reality. So one thing I will say, when I look back on it, I wish my senior year at Hofstra, I took coding classes. I wish I did more computer science classes, right? Had I known I was going to have my entire career in software and in technology, I wish I got zoned in there a little bit tighter coming out of university. So I just kind of say that as a, as a prelude to what I'm going to walk yeah. you through the process. I think it's really important. But the way you want to evaluate companies is kind of what I call the three T's. And you've heard this a hundred times, JR. Right. It's the team, it's the technology, and it's the TAM. Right. And you've heard a bunch of other leaders talk about these three areas. They might not call it the three T's, but it's kind of the same principles. So the first thing you want to evaluate is the team. So what type of company are you going to and how have they built the team? And especially your direct boss. Do you feel like you're going to get along with that person? Do you feel like they're going to be the right mentor and coach? Are they going to train and enable you the correct way? And you can do a lot of research online and you can do a ton before you even go into the interview to understand the profiles via LinkedIn and a bunch of different articles. Is, is this the type of team you want to be surrounded by in the early part of your career? Right? The second one you want to hit on is the technology. And this is arguably the most important. When you look at some of the fastest, most unbelievable growing companies, it's about the technology, right? You really have to have unique intellectual prep, uh, intellectual property to differentiate. So you might not be a technologist and you might not know a lot about it, but read articles, 
Look at who's the number one, number two in the space. Go and talk to friends and family that are in technology or whatever vertically you're looking at and see where these companies are pegged. You want to be aligned with kind of must-have technology that is uniquely differentiated in the marketplace. You don't want to just come out and start selling a commodity and selling on price, right? So really understand the technology, get deep on it, right? And then the last part is the TAM. And for some of the, the, the more recent sellers, folks coming out of school that are trying to figure out TAM is total available market, right? So TAM is something you want to look at because you want to sell and you want to be involved in multi-billion, if not trillion dollar TAMs. So trillion dollar TAMs are things like cloud computing is a trillion dollar TAM. Publicly, you know, you look at the publicly traded, you know, cloud companies, whether it's Google, whether it's Microsoft, whether it's AWS with Amazon, those are massive TAMs, right? You look at the software space, right? Hundreds of billions of dollars of TAM, and then it breaks down. You want to go into massive TAMs. You don't want to go into small niche markets, especially early in your career, because you want to learn about the whole ecosystem, not one specific sliver of the ecosystem. So comes back to the team, evaluate it, comes back to the technology, do your homework and research, and then it comes down to the TAM. Go after big, huge, massive markets. I love it. And, and I think that that team piece, that, that direct manager that you're going you're gonna to learn from, you're going to spend every day with is so so important any any thoughts on like a good a good like a favorite question that you could ask a potential hiring manager to like qualify whether or not they're a fit for you you know so we talked about the one right and now when we talk about manager talk about the one about the work ethic that to me is my kind of gold standard but the other one that i do like that's especially when i am promoting and looking at people for their first line managers and i ask them the question why do you want to manage like, why do you want to lead? And if the first words out of the mouth, oh, I want to make more money. Oh, I want to just get more equity. Oh, you know, it's just all about because I, I want, I don't buy that. I don't want those people. I want people to say, hey, I think I've done a great job as a seller. And for this first job, I think I can impact these five other sellers with what I've learned. I think I can take the knowledge, the experience, and again, the enthusiasm, the passion, the energy, and I think I can in, in, inject that into these sellers. And I can make the team better. And I enjoy the team atmosphere. I enjoy building a team. Those are the type of people. You cannot have kind of what I call these individual contributors that are only concerned about their quota and about how they are going to do by themselves. You know, kind of we call them, you know, cowboys and cowgirls. You can't sell like that in today's world. It is a team sport. And so anytime I want to look at promoting, I want to look at their team aspects, how they treat other people. How do they respond with other people's issues, challenges? And are they going into management and leadership for the right reason? So I really kind of spend a lot of time on that. Yeah, I think, you know, I think a good question to ask a potential leader of yours is to say, how do you measure your success? The answer you want to hear is, I had this many reps get promoted yep. to my peers or, or to become leaders outside of my organization. Um, one of the one of the one of the biggest lessons I learned from you, Mark. Uh, I was, you know, I, I got moved into leadership probably before I was ready, but I think I had coming from a team background. I had a good team perspective on things. But one of the things you taught me was like the idea of like as a leader, when you make decisions, putting the company first, right? Um, can you talk a little bit about that and like other kind of kind of traits that make for great great sales leadership? Yeah, you bet. So again, I, I learned this through, you know, bosses and mentors throughout my career. Um, and one of the mentors I had was a great, as I have already actually referenced his name, was, was John Hamlin. And John was a unique individual because actually he was an athlete, played football at BC High, played at uh, Mass Maritime. But he also was in the military, right? So he was a naval officer for six years and then had a, still has an extremely successful business career. You know, but Johnny very simply would lay it out kind of like a military mission where the company comes first, your people come second, and yourself comes third. And again, whether it was Johnny or other people at PTC, that mantra just lived at Parametric Technology. And by the way, you know, after PTC, I went to EMC for 15 years. And EMC was extremely similar culturally. You know, Billy Scannell and the team there did a lot of the same things that we did at PTC on the hardware side of the business. But when you're a leader, you have to kind of make hard decisions. And you have to have kind of a pecking order 
of how you prioritize making those decisions. And the first thing you have to do is, hey, we have to do the right thing. The first decision we need to make is what is the right thing for the company? The second thing is what is the right thing for our people, right? And then the third, right, which is a distant third, is yourself. Right. So we kind of use those as principles and you can interject customers in there and you can interject other things. But those guiding principles, when you have to make tough decisions, what's the right thing for the company? What's the right thing right, for your people? And what's the right thing for you? Third was something that, again, not only through PTC, but uh, EMC was definitely drilled in, you know, to myself and, and a bunch of my peers. Yeah, I, I mean, listen, it resonated with me. And now that I've, I've started my own company, like I'm, I'm trying to teach that to my people too, right? Because it's, yep. it's easy when you're young to, to think selfishly, right? Especially in times like, like we're going through now. Um, totally. any other, any other, like, you know, we're big on mentorship, Mark, as you can imagine, any other like mentors that, that really resonated with you from a business perspective and yeah, and, and I mean, listen, I've had a bunch. lessons. Yeah. I've had a bunch. I mean, listen, first and foremost, the biggest mentors I've had were my parents, right. And my brothers and sisters, right. So, very few decisions I've made in life without really talking to my parents, getting their great advice and insight, and then talking to my brothers and sisters and getting their insight, you know, also. But when I look at it from a business perspective, you know, obviously I mentioned John Hamlin is probably the one I've spent the most time with. And uh, I still, you know, obviously talk to Johnny all the time about certain subjects and things. You know, Art Coviello has been a great mentor of mine, without a doubt. You know, I bring up Joe Tucci. Um, and Joe Tucci was the CEO of EMC and I was lucky enough to get, you know, a bunch of cycles with Joe when I was at EMC as a mentor. And when I say a bunch of cycles, we'd sit down once or twice a quarter and he would carve out very generously, you know, an hour or so each time. And the, the insight of someone like that, that has seen the entire technology landscape from literally the beginning of tech all the way through to the unbelievable, you know, success that EMC had. And it was more about leadership and, and the way Joe managed and led. And he, he had this great kind of, I had this great conversation with him once. And I, I, I talked to my leaders about it all the time, which was about the different styles of leadership. And, and Joe, you know, had this great conversation with me about the difference between command and control leadership and influential leadership. You know, EMC was famous. You know, we had a 10 year run where we bought over a hundred companies. And so every time we bought a company, you couldn't have this command and control leadership style like you do in the military where one person tells every one of the lieutenants and soldiers what to do. You had an influential, you had to have influential leadership because you had to influence all of these acquisitions and all these companies we bought. And if you wanted to get a new incoming CEO, like a gentleman like Frank Sleuthman, when they bought Data Domain, no one's going to tell Frank Sleuthman what to do. At EMC. <laughs> so you had to be able to try to influence and talk to and win some of these folks over to be able to drive the greater mission. And Joe kind of said, listen, the hardest leadership style is influential leadership because you don't own the resource, you don't own the headcount, you don't have final say. But if you can strengthen that muscle and you can become a truly world-class influential leader, you're gonna do great things in life. And so there were those type of insights and things that I took from Joe and, and just about how you deal with people and having empathy and having, you know, being humble, no ego, like those are the attributes, you know, I look to some of the greatest leaders, but Joe is, is at the top of the list that hits all of those marks. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're talking to a kid from Metro West who's like every single one of my friend's parents worked at EMC. So Joe Tucci's like a rock star yeah. in, in, in my circle. So special um, man without a doubt. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, you, Mark, you've accomplished a lot in your career and I'm so curious to hear this. What, what do you, what would you say you're most proud of? You know, listen, beyond the family. So first and foremost, the family is what I'm absolutely positively most proud of my wife and, and my kids. But when I look at it from a business perspective, you know, it is a couple things, right? It's a, a lot of the people that I've worked with. And a lot of the people, you know, that have worked with me have been able to go on and have very successful careers, very successful runs. One of the things I'm proud of, I look at where I'm at today, Tenable, you know, we're, we're doing great. But, you know, there's 30, 40, and even up to now 50 people that work with me at RSA, right? That we're a tight team and we're here and we're, we're doing some phenomenal things and being able to have that great network of people, you know, that want to kind of work together and be a team. And, and go accomplish great things is something I'm super proud of. 
I think it's probably the last thing which which I, I probably learned the most in business was the international experience. So I was lucky enough with PTC, right? Early in my career, um, to be able to live in, in New Zealand and, and and open up an office in Auckland, live in Jakarta, Indonesia, you know, for a couple of years, building out Southeast Asia, lived in Germany and Munich, running Central Europe. Um, so being able to kind of get a global view of how business is done in the different cultures and how to kind of rally people from different, you know, backgrounds, different cultures, what's acceptable in one country is not acceptable in the other, and learning patience and those type of things. Um, it's hey, just been a phenomenal lesson of life for me, but it is something I look back with a lot of pride because I've got friends, you know, that I work with all around the globe and it's fun to, to touch base with them and see how their careers have grown in different parts of the world is, is kind of cool. Yeah, McMahon was not afraid to put you guys on planes, that's for sure. No, he 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 knew. Knew. <laughs> no. there's no two ways around that. He loved uh, putting expats all around the globe. So, so, so what, what goals are you still out there chasing, Mark, for, in your career? Listen, man, my goal is singular. It is all about Tenable, right? So my mission in life is in business is a single focus, all centered around the success and growth of Tenable. And that's what I spend uh, every waking hour from a business perspective focused in on is my, the same type of mantra, right? What's right for the, what's right for the company? What's right for the team? What's right for me? If I take care of those first two, right? Anything from myself will, will happen. So it is all about Tenable and some of the great things that we're doing. Uh, as a cyber company is, is where all my energy and focus is. I love it. Yeah. Team first, company first, always. Yes. Um, you bet. So these, these are the last two questions, Mark. We ask every, every guest this. Um, sure. What do you think your, we always ask some, our guests to highlight one skill that you possess that, that makes you elite as a seller. What, what do you think yours is? Um, you know what? Honestly, I would go back to the comment that I gave you before around kind of some of the energy and focus that I bring. I think, you know, when I'm talking to customers or I'm talking to partners or I'm talking to employees, um, hopefully they see it comes across as very genuine, right? I, I actually, I care a lot about what I do. I care a lot about, you know, the way I come across. I care a lot about business outcomes for our customers and our partners. I care a lot about obviously our employees doing well and having great careers and, and building out incredible careers for their families. And so when I, I take a step back, it's definitely not the intelligence portion. It definitely sits more in the energy, passion, and it's all grounded, my good friend. It is all grounded in the work ethic, right? And that is one thing I, I take a little bit of pride is uh, I'm a grinder and uh, I enjoy it. And that's what I'll always be. So I think probably those two things are, 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 are something that maybe separates me a little bit from the pack. I, I can I can preach from experience. I, I used to, I turned the lights on at 500 Boylston for a long time until you got there, and then I had to beat you in there sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> and by the way, if we ever if we both beat Ben Nye, that would have been the biggest accomplishment because he was in there before <laughs> both of us. Yeah, I, I swear he had a cotton there. I think he did too. Um, I think. He did too. <laughs> um, so you, you mentioned my my dad. He's he's my one of my biggest mentors I've ever had, and and. He ingrained in, in me and my little brothers when we were little. He used to tell us, you know, guys, there's a lot of people that play hockey, but there's not a lot of hockey players. And what he was really talking about was this that idea of professionalism and like, you know, really being a pro. Um, and whenever we talk about like really elite salespeople, we think that the highest praise you can give a salesperson is calling them a pro. So I'm curious to get your take. What, what does being a pro in sales, what does that mean to you? Yeah, so the first thing, and this goes across both sales and sales leadership, is accountability, right? So never minding all of the like the little details about getting trained and enabled and all that, it is, are you accountable? Like, do you take your job seriously, right? If you are asked to deliver a task of a certain amount of pipeline build or a certain amount of cold calls or a certain amount of outreaches, are you accountable no matter what happens to achieve that? Are you accountable when you commit a certain number and you've got to commit for a quarter? Are you accountable to be able to hit that commit? Is that something we can count on you? And if you make a mistake, right? And this goes into the second part in one second. But if you make a mistake and you don't hit it, are you accountable to say, hey, I missed this target. I missed this goal. Here's what I did right. And here's what I did wrong. And it goes into the second piece, which is so important for your young sellers 
is coachability, right? If you are not coachable, if you do not want to learn, if you do not want to sit down and get up on a whiteboard and go through a role play and go through, you know, what you need to do differently, right? If you're not coachable in regard to taking direct feedback and not being, you know, what I call dramatic in creating drama, which no sales leader, no company wants anyone that creates drama, right? You have to be coachable. And some of like the most talented people that I've seen that try to go from rep, individual contributor into leader, they are so stuck in their ways. And if you give them advice, if you give them feedback and you give them, you know, critical feedback in regard to here's what we did right or wrong and you're really being honest and they get upset and they get flustered and they make excuses. So to me, coachability is everything. And especially, you know, younger in your career, you have so much opportunity to learn from people that have been there and done it. And the selling stack and the marketing stack is changing drastically but some of these disciplines will not change. And so I think if you can kind of bring those two attributes, right, being accountable, and then obviously being coachable, I think you're off to the races. I love it. Accountability and coachability. Couldn't agree yeah. more. Could not agree more. I knew I was going to feel this way after we, we caught up, Mark, but I'm like ready to like, you know, I'm ready to apply a tenable just to work for you again. <laughs> but this was awesome, yeah. Mark. You know what Thank I think? you. You're on, a, you're on a bigger mission, man. And I love your mission. I, and, I, and I told you, I've sent you a bunch of text messages. I'm, I'm, I'm sending people your way because I love, I love what you're doing. And it resonates. And it's, you know, I think it's been a blind spot in the market. I think, you know, with your background, always helping out guys, even before you started the company from your hockey background, you know, this is something that I think there's a massive market. And I think, you know, the training, the implement, everything you give, you know, your team, I think, differentiates them in the marketplace. So I love the mission you're on, man. And I believe in it 100%. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you for giving us your time, buddy. I know you you're busy, so we really appreciate it. And our, our candidates appreciate it, too. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Good luck with selling out there. Cheers. This wraps up this episode of Merchants of Change. If you enjoyed this episode, the most meaningful way to say thanks is to submit a review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're interested in working with us, please come find us at www.shiftgroup.io.